Hi, I'm Jeff Ranke, Editorial Director of Manufacturing.net and Manufacturing Business Technology. Welcome to Security Breach. Today we're going to discuss our vulnerability within the industrial sector that is essentially a product of progress. The enhanced data sharing capabilities and operational efficiencies that have been realized in establishing an estimated 20 billion device connections in manufacturing enterprises around the globe have come at a price. In the sector's zeal to push forward with digital transformation plans and realize the benefits of automation, software, and data-driven production schemes, all of these connection points offer a soft spot for hackers to probe and pinpoint in launching various types of attacks. Joining us to discuss this evolving situation and offer some in-depth analysis from his company's recent report, The API Security Disconnect, is Philip Verloy, Technical Evangelist at No Name Security. Well, Philip, thanks so much for joining us today. You know, one of the things we wanted to talk about was this recent report that No Name put out. It talks about some of the vulnerabilities that are created by APIs. So to start out with, maybe you can just describe for our audience what an API is, what it does, and the big role that it really has in, in digital transformation for industrial, uh, for the industrial sector. Uh, the best way to think about an API is um, an intermediary that sort of allows two applications to talk to each other and exchange data. Um, so if you're talking about manufacturing or industries, for example, um, you might have a system that needs some input from an external uh, system to you know, perform a certain operation, maybe take in an order and on the basis of that order start working. Um, the nice thing about an API is that the two systems that talk to each other, they don't have to be related in any way. They could be built using different programming languages and so on. So that way you can easily integrate with all of your partners around you as a manufacturer to, uh, to sort of integrate. I think um, a good analogy or a, an analogy that's uh, used a lot is the, the restaurant innovator. So the idea would be that uh, if I'm a consumer and I'm going to a restaurant, I don't talk to the cook directly. I don't, I don't talk to the back end directly. Instead, I ask the waiter for what I want. And then the waiter talks to uh, the kitchen to get uh, the order ready because the waiter can make the translation between the front end of the house and the back end uh, of the house. And all of that happens on the basis of, of a menu, if you will. Uh, so the menu is really that contract that uh, tells application A how it can interact with application uh, B. So the reason why it's used a lot in, in digital transformation uh, projects is because we're trying to digitize all of these different processes uh, inside of our organizations and all of these processes they work on the basis of different types of technologies so apis really are the glue that can tie all of those uh, systems together and allow you to build all of those in interfaces to uh, start to exchange data absolutely no it's, it's a great overview so when we look specifically at some of the vulnerabilities of these application programming interfaces what are some of the things that the bad actors out there are, are taking advantage of what are they able to exploit yeah, so I think by its very nature, an API wants to be externally accessible. That's really the goal of an API is to have one system interact with another system. And to be able to do that, you have to sort of expose that functionality externally, especially if you're offering things to a consumer audience. So uh, malicious actors have, all, have also sort of figured that out so they can easily access those APIs because they're externally facing. Um, and then some of the vulnerabilities that they're targeting um, a good example is we have this description that we use from OWASP, which lists the top 10, let's say, API vulnerabilities, if I can call it like that. Uh, so there's a lot of known issues when it comes to API and API security. So things like broken user authentication, um, so the ability to um, maybe log in or misuse the authentication methods and to, to be able to get the data that you're not supposed to be uh, able to access. Uh, things like excessive data exposure, whereby the developer sort of sends all of the uh, all of the data external and sort of hopes that the interface in front of it deals with sort of filtering out what's what's relevant and what's not. Um, a good example, I think, is uh, and that's the number one issue on the OWASP list is uh, something called uh, broken object level authorization. Uh, so that's really the the toughest, the toughest of the tough, if I can call it like that, uh, attacks that uh, that we are seeing. Uh, it's it's the biggest misuse of uh, of APIs. Uh, so it sort of allows, um, let's say, an attacker to misuse the business logic uh, behind that API to really get to objects and to get to data that uh, he or she isn't supposed to uh, be able to access. 
So typically, Philip, is this data proprietary, like IP type stuff? Is this financial data? Is this stuff that impacts operational performance at a facility? Is there a typical type of data that they're going after? Yeah, I think it's sort of industry specific a little bit. Um, so we do see, for example, a lot of, um, let's say, retail uh, sites being uh, harvested for user data because then you have usernames, passwords, potentially credit card information and so on that you then be able to uh, use in the next stage of your, uh, your attack. Uh, when it comes to manufacturing, for example, um, it is things like, uh, let's say, IP type information that you want to specifically extract from those, um, maybe even competitive organizations, uh, and then uh, use them in, in your processes or to even disrupt uh, operations. Um, so because a lot of these, let's say, operational uh, networks are now also more and more blended with IT networks or even exposed externally, there's now also uh, an increased pressure on making sure that those systems stay safe and that you don't disrupt the actual manufacturing process uh, itself. So at a high level, I would say it's very industry specific, uh, the type of data that these bad actors are trying to get. Um, but the impact is, uh, is definitely severe across the board. Yeah, definitely could have different ramifications at different areas of within an enterprise. It's, it's, it's scary. You know, one of the things that I found really interesting, too, in the report that, that No Name put together was the fact that, like, over, I think the, the factor, the, the numbers were 71% of respondents were confident in their API security, but 76% have experienced a security issue, and 74% didn't even have an idea as far as the inventory or the number of APIs out there that they needed to secure. There seems to be this sense of confidence in the industrial sector specifically that it's not going to happen to me. We're just fine. But yet we see some of these other numbers where people are aware or they're not aware of some of these very important elements that feed into a cybersecurity plan. What do you think is playing a big role here within manufacturing in terms of, yeah, there's a threat, but it's not going to hurt me. I'm fine. Uh, it just seems to be a really interesting competing dynamic there. Yeah, I think um, I think the major disconnect is really when you look at sort of the front of the house of a manufacturing organization, where it's really well understood that this is heavily reliant on IT systems to be up and operational. And if you compare that to the actual manufacturing process, uh, that's perhaps less well understood, but we are driving uh, things into that manufacturing process through the use of smart factories or IoT devices and so on that are really blending that um, that set up more and more um, so that the tech surface is also really coming to the operational side of, uh, of the network as well. But I think the misconception tends to be today that people assume uh, that these types of industrial systems are uh, less exposed uh, to, these, to these types of attacks, uh, while in reality they're really not because what we are seeing is that um, you know people are driving deeper into that manufacturing process from an integration perspective as well. You have to connect uh, to your partners because of the, let's say, the changing business processes uh, in manufacturing, where maybe now instead of you know producing uh, a large batch of products, you're sort of going to smaller individualized batches, sort of going from. Uh, made to stock from made to order, very, very personalized, uh, very, very individualized. So in order to actually do that, you need uh, that connectivity to sit uh, in the manufacturing network as well. Um, so I think it's a real misconception to assume that those systems aren't, uh, aren't vulnerable and specifically going forward, they will become more and more vulnerable uh, indeed. So we really have to take the same level of precautions uh, that we're doing uh, quote unquote, on the front of the house, specifically IT networks, but also then uh, pull that into the operational side uh, as well. Absolutely. Well, we've talked about a lot of the challenges. Let's talk about some of the solutions out there. And that includes some of the work that your company is doing. Philip, what can you tell us about No Name Security and some of the things that you're doing to help specifically the industrial sector deal with some of these uh, vulnerabilities? Yeah, I think if we look at the industrial sector specifically, so so we, we do see this increased pressure to uh, uh, increase speed to market, um, the changes in business model that I that I already mentioned. So there's a lot more, let's say, personalization that needs to that needs to happen, and a lot more integration with uh, business partners. Uh, all of that integration tends to happen on the on the basis of API. So 
one of the things that we focus on is giving the customer a full understanding of what they have in-house. Typically, if we go to an organization um, and we try to build an inventory of all of the APIs that they have, we find that they weren't aware of 20 to 30% of those APIs. A uh, big problem, of course, if you want to secure something, you first have to be aware that you have uh, that particular object. Uh, you can't really secure what you can't uh, see. So specifically what we are doing through No Name is we are working both in pre-production during the development of the APIs to make sure that um, you are doing that in an as secure as possible manner. So all APIs that eventually reach production should be as secure as possible. That's sort of step one for us. And then the second piece of the puzzle that we're focused on is looking at the actual communication between the business partners in manufacturing, uh, between the consumers talking to the front end uh, API systems, build that full inventory, understand the full attack surface, including all of the APIs that you have, and then giving you the context to be able to make decisions on how to secure those APIs, potentially with uh, in-house tools that you already have, uh, connecting them into our uh, into our platform and making them uh, work together. Interesting. Yeah, incredibly important work and something we definitely want to talk more about. In addition to a lot of things we've talked about specifically to APIs, obviously manufacturers have cybersecurity plans in place that are far reaching and touch on a lot of different things that may come up either in before an attack happens, during and after. In working with manufacturers, are there some things that you're seeing that they're just sort of missing some of the key ingredients to make these plans as effective as they could be? Uh, job one is really getting a full inventory uh, of all of the APIs and understanding your uh, attack surface. I think that's really uh, the missing piece uh, that we find if we're talking to uh, manufacturing customers is there's an assumption that they know what's going on whilst yeah. after the sort of inventory of their APIs, they really come to the conclusion that they weren't really aware of the full extent of what they are exposing in terms of system and data uh, internally, externally, and through their uh, trusted partner networks. Absolutely. You know, we haven't talked a lot about any specific attacks, but one of the biggest one in the industrial sector are ransomware attacks. We've talked about the vulnerability through some of these APIs in terms of getting at IP data, getting at operational data and machine performance, potentially even shutting down operations as a result of these vulnerabilities. So one of the questions I like to ask everybody who comes on Security Breach in dealing with ransomware attacks, what's your opinion in terms of how do you respond to the attackers? Do you pay? Do you try to hold out? What's your perspective in dealing with ransomware? Yeah, so in my opinion, and in theory, I should say, you definitely do not pay out the, the ransom. Uh, I think it only serves to encourage more ransomware activity uh, down the line uh, and in the long run. Uh, of course, it depends on where you are in your organization when you come to that point and you have to make that decision. Meaning, if you are there and you fail to implement any let's say sufficient recovery capabilities and you've also exhausted you know every other avenue that you can take including you know looking for decryptors through um, in in Europe for example we can use Europol to to share out uh, decryptors that they can use for for uh, uh, common known ransomware attacks let's say you've exhausted all of those other um, avenues then at that point i really understand the practicality of of considering paying that ransom in theory, I, I definitely think uh, you should never do that. My opinion on that is that all organizations should work from this assume breach mentality and assume breach mindset where um, you build recovery capabilities. Um, so you assume that at some point we're going to be a victim of a ransomware attack. How can we get back to production as quickly as possible and sort of redirect funds to these recovery scenarios rather than trying to um, let's say look at things like cybersecurity, insurance for ransomware and so on um, so i think the two things you focus on is um, make sure you can recover after a breach because it's going to happen at some point and to protect yourself from things like ip theft and so on make sure you encrypt all of your data so i think if you take those two basic steps make sure that if data leaks it's encrypted and it's useless and if ransomware happens and your entire environment gets uh, encrypted and shut down, you have a recovery capability. With those two blocks, you can um, 
come a long way in, in, in terms of uh, recovering from a, from a ransomware attack. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense, Philip. And we know that these plans, when it comes to putting together a cybersecurity plan, they have to be constantly evolving just as the market changes and all these bad actors get smarter and more complex. So if you could try to look into your crystal ball a little bit and, and think of 12, maybe 18 months from now, what are some of the bigger trends that you think we're going to be experiencing in terms of maybe vulnerabilities, hackers, or, or just cybersecurity in general? Yeah, I think we'll continue to sort of see changes in attack surface um, as we adopt um, more interconnected systems. I mentioned IoT a couple of times. There's more smart devices, both on the consumer side and also on the, the enterprise side. Um, there's more 5G uh, X, X, edge networks going to be uh, built and so on. Uh, so those environments will be uh, under attack as well. Uh, and those will need a different approach um, just because of the way that they uh, operationally um, fit together. So I think we'll have to figure out a way to enforce security standards and higher security controls in those newer types of environments. And uh, that's definitely going to happen. Second piece is we are going to continue to connect systems together, but we're also going to use more and more cloud native workloads, pulling workloads apart, if you will, running part of these workloads, you know, in-house, maybe in a hybrid cloud scenario, in a multi-cloud scenario, maybe part SaaS applications and so on. So it will become really hard from a human perspective to understand what is the full extent of my, what does my application look like today? And how can I uh, monitor it sufficiently? How can I make sure that I can protect it in a correct way? So we're gonna see some augmentation there with the use of machine learning and AI in security systems that will help us connect those dots. Um, essentially, I, I, I like to think of security as a big data problem. There's so much noise uh, and it's about filtering the signal out of the noise. So I think uh, focus in the next uh, 12 to 18 months is gonna be on how can we help the human operator uh, defend these uh, more and more complex systems um, in a more, uh, let's say, uh, capable uh, manner. Makes sense. One last question here, Philip. You've mentioned 5G a couple of times. With these networks operating that much more rapidly, do you think it's going to be easier or more difficult to detect some of these attacks? Is the speed of that network going to be able to easier to see a disruption, or because it's, everything's moving so fast, is it going to be more difficult? Um, I think it's going to be more difficult for a couple of reasons. Uh, I think one is there's going to be so many devices connected to those edge networks using 5G that it's going to be hard to differentiate between what is good traffic and what is bad traffic. Second thing that's going to contribute to that is, and this is where APIs play as well, if you look at a traditional web service, you're talking HTTP to the web service backend, and it's just a couple of web calls. It's fairly easy to understand. If we talk about APIs, APIs are a, a multiple of those calls uh, to get sort of um, into the business logic and use the backend application. So again, they're filtering out what is relevant versus what is noise and what is good traffic versus what is potentially malicious traffic is gonna get uh, is gonna get harder. So also there again, I think we're gonna need to augment some of these human capabilities with automated tools to help us really understand what's uh, what's going on. Thanks, Philip. For more information on the work No Name Security does, you can go to nonamesecurity.com. Thanks for joining us today. And to catch up on past episodes, you can go to manufacturing.net, ien.com, or mbtmag.com. You can also check Security Breach out wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple, Amazon, and Overcast. For Philip Verloy, I'm Jeff Ranke, and this is Security Breach.